Thank you for joining us for the Geneva class. And uh, thank you for the interest that you show. We are resuming our class after three weeks. My wife and I were uh, in Europe taking a cruise uh, to commemorate. It was, it was designed to commu comm commemorate our uh, 60th wedding anniversary. It actually now is 62, thanks to COVID. But we did have a good experience cruising uh, in Europe. I, I want to mention that uh, the one great uh, experience for me was in Heidelberg, uh, going to the Church of the Holy Spirit and discovering where the Heidelberg Catechism was composed. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Heidelberg Catechism. So uh, we're back to the study of the Gospel of John. I want to thank Dr. Danny Hale for handling my class for three weeks. He uh, discussed uh, a portion of the letter of First Peter. Uh, of course, that's just filled with wonderful theology. So uh, very appreciative of him. And now we're back to studying the Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off a few weeks ago. Uh, and today we'll begin a study of the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, which we call the Good Shepherd Sermon. So uh, I do hope the class is a blessing to you. Uh, I certainly hope that what you hear today is truth with the word of God being the standard and measure of truth, and uh, that of everything else, God is glorified through the teaching of his word. And so we turn now to uh, the Gospel of John, the Good Shepherd Sermon. You'll notice this is part one, so we're going to divide it up in probably into three classes. Uh, and uh, this is just the first 10 verses. And the reason I'm stopping after verse 10 is the fact that uh, that John uses a, in quoting Christ, he uses the identification of Christ as the good shepherd, but he starts in the first uh, 10 verses with Jesus' identification as the door. So we're going to look at that today just to avoid confusion by shifting over to uh, the symbol of shepherd. We'll talk about Jesus as the door, and that's verses 1 through 10. So there is a, before we get into the chapter 10, there's a continuity with chapter 9 that we need to notice. You know, when the, we go to our Bible and we see it divided up into chapters and verses, you realize that the authors didn't write chapters and verses. They just wrote the whole uh, book, epistle, in this case, the uh, treatise that uh, John presents, that Jesus is the Christ. So. Uh, we, we sometimes just stop and think that um, every, this, every chapter is starting with a completely new context. That's not the case. Jesus is continuing from the incidents in chapter 9 regarding the blind beggar. The setting is the same. So let's just go back and think about Jesus healing that blind man and what the result was, the Pharisees getting very upset about that and interviewing the man and his parents and trying to get him to denounce Jesus as some type of false teacher, which he did not do. So the beggar is probably still there. Jesus' disciples are probably still there. The Pharisees, you can know that they're going to be there. They are always following Christ around, trying to do find something wrong with what he says. And there's probably a crowd that has gathered. So that's going to continue the same audience, really, that we saw in chapter 9. But he's going to shift figures, not subject, but figures. He's going to be talking about sheep. He was talking about being blind or being able to see. And for that, let's go to the last part of chapter 9 and these words. We're reviewing them now from a few weeks ago. Jesus said, for judgment... I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Now, of course, that's a very difficult statement to try to understand. We talked about before the fact that we need to understand that, that Jesus is speaking not of physical 
blindness. Of course, the, the man who was healed was physically blind, but based on that, he is, is now moving to the fact of, of, that people can be spiritually blind. They do not see the reality of spiritual truth. And those who do not see would represent those who understand that they don't see, which is really saying we don't understand the gospel. And so he's come so they may, may see. But the people who are going to claim that they understand, which of course would be the Pharisees, are going to be made blind. So this, this subject, this idea of understanding the gospel is going to carry over. So let's go now to the text, 10 verses of chapter 10. Truly, truly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all, out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now you see in this uh, introductory comments of, of Jesus that he mentions uh, sheepfold, he mentions door, he mentions thief and robber, he mentions the shepherd and, and of course the sheep and the gatekeeper. So we have a number of different uh, figures of speech and the question is what do they represent? Before we get into it, um, let me show you one of the most famous, I think, uh, pictures of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. This is in the tomb of Galaplacidia in Ravenna, Italy. The best mosaics in the world are to be found in Ravenna. This, this is a mosaic uh, art, uh, and uh, the, Jesus is, is in the midst of the sheep. You notice how the sheep are looking to him uh, from both directions. And this is, if you go to Ravenna, you'll see the most beautiful mosaics in all the world. And it was, uh, these buildings were constructed for the most part in the sixth century by the Emperor Justinian. Now, Martin Bucer, who was uh, one of the great reformers, Protestant reformers, I even refer to him as the father of reformed theology. That may be an exaggeration. Some may disagree with me on that. But the fact that uh, he was mentor to John Calvin, I think, uh, in, lends some justification for that conclusion. But the first publication that Busser did that would gained him any kind of reputation was a book called Das Himselves. And uh, that meant, if we translate it into English, that no one should live for himself, but rather for his neighbor, and how men are able to come to this. Now remember that the question, the problem under consideration throughout chapter nine, chapter 10 is the failure of the Jewish leadership, the failure of them, their leadership even to understand what they should be doing and how they should proceed. And of course, they are failing to care for the people uh, who are committed to them. Now, when the Reformation occurred, they pick up this theme of caring for souls, the pastoral subject. And this is true with all reformers. It's true with Luther. It's true with Calvin and, and Melanchthon and all the others. Uh, their main focus, their main purpose, as they understood it, was to care for souls, to be good pastors. 
Now, out of that, of course, developed the great doctrines of the Reformation. So that's where Martin Bucer, who was the reformer from Strasbourg, put the emphasis on the care of souls. And as uh, Dr. Boyce, James Montgomery Boyce, examined that book, he reached uh, five conclusions that uh, Bucer made during that book. In order to care for souls, one searches for the lost, brings back the strays, binds the wounded, strengthens the weak, and guards and feeds the healthy. Now you think of that in terms of sheep, think of it in terms of people. Pastors have the responsibility to do these five things, search for the lost, bring back the strays, bind the wounded, strengthen the weak, guard and feed the healthy. And this is the undergirding thought throughout chapter 10. The benefit of the, the sheep, the blessing to the sheep, and the, the importance of the pastors in caring for the sheep. Of course, sheep and shepherds is a major theme of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, raising sheep was very prominent in the Middle East. It still is today. And so it's not to be surprised that uh, the Bible mentions sheep and shepherds many, many times. Here's just an example of a few. Uh, in Psalm 100, verse 3, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. A relationship between God and his people, the same as that of shepherd to sheep. Mark 6:34. When he, Jesus, went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Mark 14, verse 27, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And from Hebrews 13, 20, now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. And 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, the undergirding necessity for pastoral care uh, is based on the fact that sheep need pastoral care. They are dependent animals. They are not capable of taking care of themselves. They are helpless. We might even say they are stupid. And uh, they got in, get into all kinds of trouble. They wander into places where predators can find them. Uh, oftentimes they'll fall off a cliff. They don't uh, realize where they are. And then sometimes they get actually stuck upside down, kind of like a turtle on its back. That's called a, a tube being cast, C-A-S-T. And when they get on their back, they just can't get back up on their legs. And consequently, if nobody helps them, they're going to die. So the point is, sheep need pastoral care. Now, one of the figures in chapter 10 is that of the sheepfold. What do we mean by a sheepfold? Well, there are two kinds of sheepfolds. Of course, there are places where sheep are kept at night. Uh, they're kept at night because there are dangers at night, and the sheep must be protected from those dangers. And uh, then in the daytime, they go out of the sheepfold, and they are led by their uh, shepherd uh, into places where they can feed or drink. Now, there are two kinds of sheepfolds in a country area, out of the country. Uh, shepherds would build a circle of rocks and leave an opening and during the night, the shepherd would lay his body across that opening. Therefore, if, if a sheep tries to go out of the sheepfold, to leave it, go out into the darkness, into the dangers that lay out there, uh, he would uh, step on the, the shepherd, and the shepherd would uh, awaken and would, of course, uh, put the sheep back into the fold. Now, in towns and villages, a permanent room or enclosure was constructed with an actual door. Now, I can see how both of these examples would apply to, to Christ. Uh, certainly, he could protect the sheep with his own body. That makes sense. 
uh, and it could be also a literal door. In verses 1 to 10, Jesus is, as we just saw in the reading of the scripture, Jesus identifies himself as the door. Now, in the following verses, 11 to 18, which, Lord willing, we shall look at next week, he identifies himself as the shepherd. And as I said, in order to make it clear and not be any confusion, uh, I thought it best to focus on the one topic at a time. So today, the door. Matthew Henry comments on this passage. Now, uh, he, he calls it a parable. Uh, is it a parable? Is it an allegory? Uh, just what kind of symbolic language are we talking about here? There are definitions, particular definitions for, uh, for instance, the distinction between parable and allegory or metaphor or simile or all of these various uh, uh, symbolic usages of language. Alinsky calls it a paroimia. Uh, that uh, term is one I wasn't familiar with, but it uh, is kind of a midway uh, situation between a parable and an allegory. Uh, I will say no more about that, I'll let you decide how you want to describe this symbolic language. But let's look at what Matthew Henry says. Whatever difficulties, and I think the fact that the, these words are being used uh, indicate there are difficulties in understanding this. Whatever difficulties there may be in the sayings of the Lord Jesus, we shall find him ready to explain himself if we be but willing to understand him. Now that's very important. And Christians do have the God-given ability to understand. So we shall find one scripture expounding another, and the blessed spirit interpreter to the blessed Jesus. Oh, those are excellent words. Christ in the parable had distinguished the shepherd from the robber by this, that he enters in by the door, that is, Christ does. Uh, and now, in the explication of the parable, he makes himself to be both the door by which the shepherd enters and the shepherd that enters in by the door. So Christ as the door, first 10 verses of chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. Just stop and look at that for a moment. The shepherd, and I think Jesus is here talking about the true shepherd of the sheep, will enter by the door. And Jesus said, I am the door. Therefore, True shepherds of the sheep enter into the sheep fold, which of course we can understand as a gathering of, of sheep, God's people. And on the other hand, anyone trying to come in another way would, would be an illegal way, would be the thief and the robber. Now a thief is one who steals. A robber may well steal, certainly, but a robber, and the difference is a robber is, is willing to use violence in pursuit of his goals. So Boyce says, Dr. Boyce says that, that Jesus is here using that example of the sheep pen in the town with an actual physical gate in care of a porter. Now there's only one gate into this sheepfold and very likely that gatekeeper is God the Father himself. The shepherd leads his flock in and whoever comes in with the shepherd and goes out with the shepherd is going to be safe and find what he needs. Uh, the sheep then are going to be, and these are the words of Dr. Boyce, are going to be saved, safe, and satisfied. And I want us to think about what the benefits are, and you can take these three words and start with them, and we'll look at some others uh, leading up to, to verse 10. What the Christian, what the, the sheep, of God have in Christ salvation, safety, satisfaction. Again, the thief is one who steals, the robber may use violence, and the point is the action of the two persons in regard to the door. The thief and the robber do not use the door. Now, if the sheepfold, we can imagine perhaps here as a congregation, church, and if there are thieves and robbers, that is, false teachers in the church, they have not entered by the door of Jesus Christ. That's a point I think we should understand. 
so true shepherds versus thieves and robbers. Jesus is laboring to present a contrast between shepherds who enter by the true door and himself. Who are these shepherds who enter by the true door? They are faithful pastors of the flock of God. But thieves and robbers climbing over, entering another way, not by the door of Christ, bypassing the door of Christ, are, their interest is in plundering the flock. Their interest is not in the welfare of the flock. You need to understand that. We deal with false teachers, and there are many in the church. Their goal has nothing to do with helping people. It has everything to do with uh, their uh, receiving uh, adulation and acknowledgement of power and glory. That's what they're looking for. So the sheep, and I think here we have to think of the sheep as being true sheep, that is the elect of God, that is true Christians. So the sheep do not hear their voices, very important. True sheep of God, people who are really saved, people who are really followers of Christ, do not hear the voices of false teachers. They are protected by the Holy Spirit and do not naturally then follow them. So we find the thieves and robbers using devices to try to deceive the sheep. Can they deceive the elect? Well, of course, they cannot uh, permanently do so. They might temporarily do so, but they can certainly deceive many people who are not true Christians. And uh, they're going to use their own selfish and false devices in doing that. So I thought about what are the examples uh, of people who do not follow the God-given structure of the church the entrance through the door of Jesus Christ, but climb over the wall, their tactics may involve political methods, uh, social methods, uh, methods of entertainment. Uh, they may present a moral agenda suggesting uh, that one is saved by virtue of, of a high degree of morality and keeping the law, very legalistic therefore. Um, and we can use the word liberal. And I use the word liberal in the sense of denying the truth of the word. Uh, in a sermon recently, Pastor Jim uh, enumerated a number of these categories, uh, such as antinomianism and such like. And it's, it's still the same thing. The false approach, the false methodology that false teachers use, they're still doing it. And Jesus, of course, wants to protect his sheep from that. And so he continues. Now, remember that throughout the Gospel of John, we're going to see repetition over and over again. And each time there's a repetition, there's something added. And so we have to watch for that which is added. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So uh, again, when we deal with symbolic language, uh, there's the possibility if we really think about what it means and the implications of it, uh, we're going to go deeper perhaps than we would with literal language. And of course, Christ is doing exactly that here with the figures. Uh, he represents himself as the door through which shepherds bring their sheep in and out. This idea of in and out, this uh, ingress, egress idea of uh, coming in and out safely, in at night to find safety and protection from uh, the predators and, and the dangers that are out there and going out safely in the daytime and, and being safeguarded as they uh, fed and, and would find drink. So Jesus is the door which allows the shepherds, that is the true pastors, and go back to Booser now, uh, the true faithful pastors doing their work. As I said, the gatekeeper is probably God. Uh, nothing more is said about the gatekeeper other than the fact that the gatekeeper recognizes Christ uh, and opens, the shepherds would point to faithful pastors of God's flock. And these true pastors, true shepherds, and of course you understand the word pastor means shepherd, uh, true shepherds enter by the one door. 
but that thieves and robbers, that is false teachers, do not. That distinguishes them. No false teacher comes in through Christ. That's impossible. They have to find another way, another uh, gimmick, uh, another uh, means, uh, methodology to try to convince the sheep. The true pastors will be safe and the sheep will be safe. They can come and go safely. That is what Jesus is saying. And coming and going would represent life and the activities of life, not just going to church, but everything. So if we make some contemporary application, uh, using the same words that Jesus uh, made, did earlier, and I'm not going to read it again, Jesus says, all who came before are false prophets and false teachers. He calls them thieves and robbers, but he's talking about false prophets, false teachers. Now, if it's true that those who came before him, and there were true prophets, of course, but he's talking about and focusing on people like the, the Pharisees and, and the Sanhedrin of his day. There were many false prophets, false teachers. I think we can say also that we have false prophets and false teachers who come after him as well and will come after him until the end of time. So uh, that implication is there. But the point Jesus is making is all of these false prophets and false teachers are unsuccessful in their attempt to get true sheep to listen to them. The sheep do not listen. They'll find people who listen, but they're not going to find the true sheep who will listen at least on any uh, long-term basis. So whatever they accomplish is short-lived. And those who enter through the door, who is Christ, find blessings not imaginable under a false system. And I think this is what Jesus is stressing here. Uh, the false teachers are going to plunder the flock. They offer nothing good to the flock. They are there uh, to um, use them for their own selfish purposes. They are interested in power. But Christ, on the other hand, and Christ's faithful shepherds, Provide for the sheep that which is great blessing in the complete life that they have as they are saved, as they go in and go out, as they find pasture. Let's go back to Matthew Henry for another comment about Christ as the door. He is as a door shut to keep out thieves and robbers and such as are not fit to be admitted. He is as a door open for passage and communication. First, by Christ as the door, we have our first admission into the flock of God. Secondly, we go in and out in a religious conversation. And, and I think we need to understand that Matthew Henry here is using conversation in the old way that we don't use it today. He's talking about life, everyday life. So we could really translate that we go in and out in our religious daily life, assisted by him, accepted in him, walking up and down in his name. Thirdly, by him, God comes to his church, visits it, and communicates himself to it. Fourthly, by him as the door, the sheep are at last admitted into the heavenly kingdom. I think Henry made some very important points there. I'd like to just briefly go back over them. Christ as the door, Admit, we, we find our admission for the first time into the flock of God. When we first come as believers, uh, we're, we're baptized. We, uh, we are able to come to the table. This is all new. But secondly, it becomes our, our life. It becomes our daily life. And so we go in and out. Uh, we have this uh, freedom uh, to live, going in to worship, I would think, going out to live the Christian life assisted by him, accepted in him, walking up and down in his name. Third, and this is important, by him, God comes to his church, visits it, and communicates himself to it. So uh, God is going to speak to his people, for instance, in holy worship. And fourth, the sheep are admitted finally into the heavenly kingdom. So what Henry is saying is there are multi-purposes here for the door and the sheep that are great blessings to the sheep. And he continues, Christ is the door of the shepherds. 
so that none who come not in by him are to be accounted pastors, but according to the rule laid down, thieves and robbers, though they pretended to be shepherds, but the sheep did not hear them. This refers to all those that had the character of shepherds in Israel, whether magistrates or ministers, that exercised their office without any regard to the Messiah or any other expectations of him than what were suggested by their own carnal interests. I think Henry has correctly identified the shepherds as Jesus is using that term. Let's see what John Calvin has to say on Christ as the door of the shepherds. Christ was dealing with scribes and priests who were regarded as the shepherds of the church. He had therefore to take the honor of this title away from them if he wanted his teaching to be received. And I understand what Calvin is saying here. As long as they are respected and given honor as uh, the leaders of Israel, uh, of God's people, and they are false in their nature and in their intent, uh, then this is a travesty. So what Jesus is doing is simply taking their title away from them and simply saying to these people who are false, who are not uh, truly following God, you are not shepherds, you are thieves and robbers. And Calvin continues, although he is here speaking of ministers, he wants not so much them as God speaking through them to be heard. And of course, this comes again back to the, the pastor's great responsibility in preaching the gospel is not to preach himself, but to preach Christ and him crucified. And we'll go back to Matthew Henry once again. Christ is the door of the sheep. By me, of course, here Christ is referred to, by me, through me, as the door, if any man enter into the sheepfold as one of the flock, he shall be saved, shall not only be safe from thieves and robbers, but he shall be happy. He shall go in and out. Notice here the advance from just being safe to the idea of being happy, satisfied. Here are first plain directions on how to come into the fold. We must come in by Jesus Christ as the door. By faith in him as the great mediator between God and man, we come into covenant and communion with God. There is no entering into God's church, but by coming into Christ's church. In the meantime, they shall go out, go in and out and find pasture. True believers are at home in Christ. When they go out, they are not shut out as strangers, but have liberty to come in again. When they come in, they are not shut in as trespassers, but have liberty to go out. You see how Henry is emphasizing the liberty we have in Christ. Now, true Christianity is not a cult uh, that captures people and, and holds them uh, in some type of bondage. Uh, no, there is liberty, liberty to live, liberty to be happy, liberty to uh, safely find the things that we need and the things that we enjoy in life. Uh, never shut out, never shut in. Now, let's go to the next thought as Jesus is progressing. And the focus here seems to be not so much on the door, but now on the sheep, and this becomes a transition to Jesus' uh, identity as the good shepherd. He says, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, sheep are not uh, forced to, uh, to go. They're not driven like cattle. The sheep are led by a shepherd, and the sheep follow him. That is, is significant. So Christ, as our good shepherd, leads us. And 
the word here indicates he recognizes them. He calls them by name and leads them out. You remember earlier, we, Jesus talked about uh, speaking to the Pharisees and uh, castigating them. Uh, he said, you do not understand what I say. And we pointed out that really meant you don't understand my language. I'm speaking a foreign language as far as you're concerned. And the words, therefore, that I use, you don't understand because you don't understand the language. And, and this th thought comes up again and again. Jesus speaks a language that the sheep understand. And they are, as we've noted before, they don't become sheep at the point that Jesus speaks to them. They rather follow him and recognize his voice because they are sheep. They are sheep given to him by the Father for salvation. Uh, and therefore, the fact that they are sheep uh, points to their uh, election and regeneration. As one uh, pastor said, uh, they are sheep and they hear because they have sheep ears. They have the God-given ability to understand the language. Now look at what Calvin has to say. I think what he summed it up very, very well here. According to the secret election of God, we are already sheep in his heart before we're born. And we begin to be sheep in ourselves through the calling by which he gathers us into his fold. So we are sheep already, as far as he's concerned, but to, to become sheep as uh, in our personal experience, uh, we do so as a result of the call of the gospel. And he calls his own sheep by name. The sheep hear his voice, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. What Christ wants us to notice, I think here, what John wants us to notice, is the personal nature of the relationship between uh, a follower of Christ and Christ himself, or between the sheep and the shepherd. All sheep hear his voice because they are sheep, and he calls them by name, each individual name. Under the figure of Jesus as the door, the calling would be by faithful pastors. In other words, pastors who preach the gospel would thus reach the elect of God, they would uh, be called through the preaching of the gospel. And the word is made effectual by the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the elect. So this points to what we call personal redemption. Uh, and, and our salvation is very personal. It's not an uh, impersonal group uh, situation. It, it is a very intimate relationship. And thus the effectual call of the gospel when the gospel comes to us in a very personal way. And he leaves them out. They recognize his voice. They recognize their name. So Jesus said, when he has brought all out his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. A shepherd would lead his sheep from the fold by calling them. They have names, and they recognize their names. Now, within a sheep fold, there would be many different flocks, especially if the case in one in a big city. We talked about a sheep fold in the city. There's a person that is a permanent uh, installation. So within that sheep fold, there would be many different flocks. Uh, this distinction between sheep fold and flocks is an important one because uh, sometimes people really get hung up on different denominations and denominations would suggest rather a flock than than the, the whole uh, sheepfold. So uh, Jesus is calling his, uh, his flock by name. And for instance, he called Matthew by name. He called Philip. He called Zacchaeus. He called Zach, Z Lazarus. He called Mary by name and thus the sheep who belong to that particular shepherd to that particular flock would hear their names would come and follow the shepherd and jesus is saying that's the way it is in the relationship between him and his people calvin said we should observe the reason given why the sheep follow 
It is because they can distinguish the shepherds from the wolves by the voice. Again, if I can uh, point this out, uh, we are given the ability to understand the language. That is a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit to God's people. So it is because they can distinguish the shepherds from the wolves by the voice. This is the spirit of discernment by which the elect discriminate between the truth of God and man's false inventions. Not does he commend the obedience of faith only because the sheep come submissively at the shepherd's voice, but also because they do not heed the voice of strangers. There's a built-in protection here. And when Jesus comes to say, and we'll look at this in coming uh, studies, when he says, my sheep will never perish, you have to understand the reason for that is that they have the ability to understand the shepherd and the willingness to follow the shepherd. And so we come to verse 10, very interesting verse. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So here is, Jesus now distinguishes the motives the, the difference between the motives of, on the one hand, the thief and the robber, and his own motive. The motive for a thief is to steal, kill, and destroy. He plunders the flock for his own advantage. Jesus said, I am come that they, his sheep, may have life and have it abundantly. Now, I've tried to stress throughout this study uh, the many times that Jesus intimates that there is something more than just survival, that uh, there is this in and out, going in and out and finding pasture, this, this safety, satisfaction. Uh, th this is the Christian life. And I think we see it really brought to the fore here in Jesus' statement about, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I recall a good friend of mine, worked very closely with him, who told me that before he understood the nature of salvation to be a matter of salvation by God's grace through faith, that he read this passage where Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. And he, he said, I, I didn't know what that meant. I know this would be something very good, but I knew I didn't have it. Well, of course he does now, now that he understands the extent of God's love and mercy. So uh, I, my motive is they might have life and have it abundantly. James Montgomery Boyce says the abundant life uh, means, and I think, again, he's trying to summarize something that is vast, that is, that cannot be uh, simply uh, enumerated in three points, but this is what he says. Abundant life means contentment arising from realization that God is able to supply all needs, and I might add, and does supply our needs. Secondly, satisfaction, having enough. And that's a major topic. Paul talks about it, uh, about the satisfaction of the end. I'm content. And thirdly, abundance suggests surplus, overflowing. So that's the Christian life. But Boyce points out, before you have an abundant life, there must be life. Of course, there has to be life before the life can be become abundant. And that means regeneration. That means the new birth at the time that the Spirit gives us life. Oh, so again, let's go to Booser and Dossi himself, his book on the pastoral care of, of souls. So in order to care for souls, Booster says, there's this search for the lost, bringing back the strays, binding up the wounded, strengthening the weak, guarding and feeding the healthy. Well, of course, we cannot uh, deal with uh, the matter of sheep and shepherds without Psalm 23. And as I read over this, it's a very familiar psalm, everyone knows it, but as I read over it, think about the points that Jesus made that we've looked at today, the points in the first 10 verses of chapter 10. The Lord is my shepherd. Of course, we'll look more about that next week. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. There again is that safety that the shepherd is gonna provide for the sheep as they leave the sheepfold. He leads me beside still waters. Sheep do not drink from waters that are in motion. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I think uh, in here in the Old Testament, the words of David, we have uh, against, uh, under the uh, figure of the sheep and the shepherd, a description of the abundant life that one has in Christ. Next week, we're going to turn to Christ as he identifies himself as the good shepherd. So I thank you for uh, being a part of our study today and do pray that it has been a profitable and, and enjoyable and interesting study uh, and encourage you to join us next week as we continue our study. So may uh, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace.